I'm Helen Smith, Director of Technology and Media Production at the Eastman School of Music, and I'm delighted to be joined today by Tony Woodcock. Tony is uh, the president of the New England Conservatory, I believe started this summer. Correct. And before that, he ran the Minnesota Orchestra, the Oregon Symphony, and many orchestras in the UK. So I'm very interested to find out more about his background and some of the challenges and some of the lessons learned in terms of running orchestras both in the UK and the US and then how that translates into working in music education and transforming a, a music school as well. So Tony, maybe you could start off telling us a bit more about your work in the UK. Okay, uh, well it goes back, I'm, I'm sorry to say many, many years now, it goes back 32 years. Uh, when I, I first started, my great ambition was to run uh, an orchestra. And as the uh, Chinese say, be, beware what you wish for, because that finally happened at the very beginning of the 1980s when I was offered the chance of working with Richard Hickox and the City of London Symphonia, terrific chamber orchestra in London. And uh, I started there as, as, as general manager, and then I had opportunities to run uh, uh, St. David's Concert Hall, uh, the National Concert Hall of Wales. Um, a lot to do with orchestras there, and I'd previously also taught a lot of orchestras, so the orchestras were very much part of my uh, of my blood, as it were. Uh, and then I went up to the uh, to the northwest and ran the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic, and then down to the south coast to run the Bournemouth Symphony Orchestra and the Bournemouth Symphonietta. And then, um, virtually ten years ago now, in the 1998, I had the opportunity of coming over to America as a result of some work that a headhunter was doing in California uh, to run the Oregon Symphony. So it's been on both sides of the Atlantic and it's been what I would uh, describe as a, quite a ride and quite an adventure. And I'd like to talk to you some more about some of those adventures. Mm -hmm. So first of all, I wonder what your first impressions are moving from running UK orchestras to running American orchestras. What were your first impressions, your first thoughts, your challenges? I think I would start with my first uh, um, misperception. Mm -hmm. uh, my first misperception was running a UK orchestra would be very, very similar to running uh, an orchestra in America. And they are really so, so different. Uh, and I'll try and, and characterize that mm, for you. Do. Uh, running an orchestra in, in the UK, uh, you're, you're doing a couple of things, really. You're, you're being the business manager, obviously, looking after the, the best interests of the organization, looking at the budgetary side, looking at, at the management, uh, selling the organization. But you're also looking at the artistic side very, very strongly. Um, there are no music directors per se in the UK that I'm aware of to date, but there are principal conductors, and the principal conductors would be responsible to the, the managing director and uh, you would form a very strong bond, you would form a very strong artistic team and you would move forward. And that was always my, uh, my experience in the UK. And is that something that is, um, would you say it's a European model or is it very much specifically a UK model? I think it's it's very much a UK mm -hmm. model, and I think there are there are some terrific examples of how that has worked as a paradigm in in the UK. Clive Gillinson with the LSO, I think, is a classic case of how successful uh, that can be. Moving to uh, America, there were a couple of things that immediately surprised me. One was uh, the huge emphasis given to fundraising, because public subsidy is so tiny in this country, although I'll, I'll return to how it's indirect subsidy in, in, in many ways. Right. Um, but there is a need to raise colossal sums of money for the annual fund. And the, the annual fund is it's um, what I would describe as the, the Sisyphus fund. You, you, you roll your stone to the top of the, the hill and then the new financial year starts and it rolls down to the bottom and you start oh, yeah. all over again. So you have to raise millions of dollars as far as that's concerned. And the millions of dollars, um, unlike the UK, where when you were raising money, money primarily came from corporations. It came in the form of sponsorship. 
-hmm. Philanthropy, I don't think, has really been heard of in terms of, of real art support for orchestras. In America, it is completely different. I would say 80% of the money that uh, American orchestras raise comes from individuals, and it comes from individuals for very good reason. It comes philanthropically philanthropically. It's about an individual's or a family's passion for the art form, passion for their, for their community. Only 20% would come from, from corporations. So the exact reverse of what you have experienced in, in the UK. So if you're going to be raising that amount of money, and particularly if you're going to be raising money from individuals, you've really got to be out in the community, you've got to be establishing relationships, you've got to be entertaining, and you've got to be entertaining breakfast, lunch, dinners, and anything else in between those things in order to uh, really allow relationships to burgeon because they, they, that develops as a result of the amount of time and the amount of attention that, that you give it. Uh, my wife was also very surprised uh, in that in the UK she was Mrs. Manager, in America she was First Lady mm -hmm. of, uh, of whichever community, First Lady of the orchestra as, as Mrs. President, and uh, she would be expected to entertain, she would at home, um, at receptions, at dinners and at functions, and to be very much a, a very strong visible sign of of the orchestra's president, pre presence in, in the community. Uh, now she has taken to that and flies with it and is extremely comfortable with it. But to begin with, th those demands and, and that need for the organization came as a surprise. Uh, the, the second uh, surprise was the, the role of the music director. And uh, up until 10 years ago, I was used to uh, uh, a relationship with the, the principal conductor, which would be very, collegial, which would be uh, very much a collaboration. But there, in American orchestras, there's a very strong divide between the work of its president, mm -hmm. which let's define that as being um, management slash um, fundraising, um, and the music director. The music director is basically seen as being his, his or her own entity artistically. Oh, so the artistic planning is not so integrated. Uh, it, 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 it can, I, I mean I have looked at this across the country, uh, it can be a very very isolated function within an organization. It can be the a music director saying this is what he or she wants to do, this is their vision. Uh, it may not have anything to do with the institutional priorities of the organization. It may not have very much to do with the experience of the, of the audience, but I, I think that they uh, are allowed to have that degree of autonomy and that degree of power. Uh, I, I've, I've often um, given a very graphic example of, of that by saying that it's only in America where the power of the ancient pharaohs still resides in the power that people allow their, their music directors. And that has many strong features to it, but it has many weaknesses well, as well. Would you well. say the main impact is either for good or for bad? I think it's